Uh, hi everyone, I'm Shane. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about something we built in Mainframe uh, that we call Mainframe OS. Um, and with particular attention to what we're using in Swarm and how we've implemented various features using Swarm features. Um, so, first of all, what is Mainframe OS? So, it's a platform for decentralized applications. Um, and we've taken like a little bit of, or a bit of a different tack than um, like Web3 dApps. So we're actually following more of like the sandbox model, so closer to how apps exist on uh, iOS and Android. Um, so yeah, apps are sandbox by default. They have to request explicit permissions to do anything if they want to ex escape the sandbox. Um, developing the dApps, uh, the defaults are always to provide or to preserve privacy and security for the users. Um, and really, like using cryptography and decentralized technologies can sometimes just be really hard uh, for a newcomer. So we're just really trying to make it easier for developers to do the, do the right thing without having to get an advanced degree. And yeah, uh, so also the, uh, the dApps are built using web technologies. So basically you're gonna be using JavaScript. Um, so I'll just give a quick status on what stuff we have implemented in our SDK already. Um, so the web three stuff, as far as I know, is mostly all there. Um, you can, so if you have an existing Ethereum DAP and you're using uh, web3.js, it's basically just like a drop-in replacement to just hook your web three provider into our SDK and everything should just keep working. Uh, for comms, so uh, previously we we've been like big proponents of PSS and think it's uh, awesome. Um, we've had some issues more recently with, basically if you're gonna wanna use PSS, you're gonna be running a full swarm node, which is difficult for onboarding users to convince them to, to do this. So we've actually removed some of the PSS stuff and we're hoping to put it back in once light nodes are available and then it's a bit more palatable for, for new users coming on. So uh, all of the communication stuff we have right now is using feeds. Um, really the way we envision comms to work is uh, by having feeds as per for a persistence layer and then layering PSS on top for like real time snappiness. Um, so we see them kind of coexisting, but right now, yeah, we just have feeds. So you still get the persistence, which is nice. Uh, in terms of storage APIs, right now we're just providing storage for the like the local user. So we're not supporting files, well, just currently it doesn't support like sharing files with other users, but obviously this is something we want to do, um, especially things like images or avatars, you know, this just makes the app feel like nicer for the user. So this is where we're going with storage. But right now we have just personal storage um, then on the encryption side, we're still just kind of getting up to speed with this. Um, we really just want to make it work first. Uh, but on the encryption side, the local storage is encrypted for like your private data. But currently all the communication stuff is unencrypted, but obviously we want it all to be encrypted. And all the pieces are in place to do it, we just have to implement it. Um, so the rest of the talk is mostly going to be like demoing like mainframe OS and what you can do with it today and just some of the flows that we think are interesting and I'll talk about how it hooks into Swarm. So um, yeah, like whoever's closer to the video screens is going to have a better time. Um, also hopefully the videos will work in this uh, LibreOffice. Um, so this is the onboarding. So once you open the app for the first time, we ask you to provide a password, and this is gonna be used to encrypt your local data on disk, so things like your keys, and then keep them secure. Uh, and once we do that, we ask you to create an identity. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I've, I've anticipated this, and I'll just play the videos directly. Um, open source. going to play. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, we saw this. 
So then we ask you to create an identity. Uh, so this is just used for um, like communicating with other users and signing data and this kind of thing. So you give your name and you have the option to make your identity discoverable. And this is really just gonna make making contact with other users more convenient. Um, we also ask you to create an Ethereum wallet and then this is just mostly used for the Web3 integrations. So uh, this is just this kind of standard wallet onboarding. So you can import an existing wallet or create a new one. Um, we show your seed phrase and impress upon you that you must store it somewhere safe. Um, but I'm not gonna do that and I'm gonna skip it. Um, this is what, then then you come to the main home screen in mainframe OS. So this shows uh, like your applications. And if you go to your identity, you can see the identity you've already created uh, with an ID. And this ID is gonna be used for making contact with other users. Um, so we'll skip that one. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna just show you like one of the, one of the basic apps and then how it uses storage. Uh, so this is a DAP we, we just created called Noted. It's just a simple note-taking app. So if you want to install a DAP, you click install. It'll show you before you install it what permissions the DAP requires. And then if you're happy enough to accept those uh, permissions, you can download the DAP from Swarm. It'll store a copy of the DAP on your local disk. And then now you have the option to open it. Um, so dApps run inside their own sandboxed windows, um, as you can see here. Um, and yeah, so, so this dApp here just allows you to create some private notes, and then um, in the background, when you're finished making changes, it'll stink, it, it syncs it to your local swarm storage, so that if you need to recover your, um, your vault, which is where all your keys are stored, then you can, you can like regain access to all this data. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, how we make contact with other users. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, so um, I'm gonna just show you one of the data structures that we use. Uh, so it's this one. Okay, so um, I showed you this, this ID earlier that I said you could share with other users. So I'm actually just gonna, this is just really a feed hash. So I'm just gonna look it up in Swarm and I'll just show you like what the public data that's uh, shown is. So um, when other user downloads your feed, they can see your, uh, sorry, I thought it was paused. Okay, uh, they see your public key um, and then some of your profile information. So because I made my profile information discoverable, we see my name and my Ethereum address. And then this really just helps with the contact integration. It means you can unlock more functionality. Um, and I also have this uh, first contact address. And then this is gonna be used to help like bootstrap uh, communication with another user. Um, so, uh, the, one of the problems with using feeds for, um, for like uh, a cold like connection with someone else is that if you create a feed and send them a message, they don't necessarily know where to look for that message. Um, so, uh, we're calling this like bootstrapping problem first contact. Um, so yeah, I wanna see that video. Okay, so the way we've implemented this is uh, using feeds. <coughs> So when you want to, so um, this is one of our users, Alice, and she wants to make contact with Bob. <clears throat> so the first thing she does is Bob has to send her his contact feed. Um, and then so she gets access to his public key and his first contact address. Uh, so the first thing she does is create a private feed that is gonna be used for uh, her communication with Bob. She then encrypts the reference to that feed using Bob's public key and then posts that in another feed. Uh, and this feed is gonna be in a predictable location uh, because Bob needs to know where to look for it. So um, 
that predictable location is used is uh, determined using Alice's first contact address. So when, when Bob looks up Alice's feed, he'll see her co first contact address. So she uses that as the user, and then the topic is Bob's hashed public key. And then um, Bob can use this data to, to like discover this feed and then find out and then decrypt this data and then find out where the private communications are going to happen. Uh, so once Alice does this, she needs to see if Bob has reciprocated. So uh, she takes Bob's first contact address um, and hashes her public key. And then um, we'll just start like polling that location and then wait for Bob to, to like publish to that feed. She knows where the, the, the feed is going to be and she's going to wait for Bob to do it. When Bob reciprocates, um, now they both know about these two private feeds. So these can be used for like bootstrapping any further communications inside um, mainframe OS. Um, and to give you, i uh, show you what that looks like. Um, so um, I've got Bob's feed address in the clipboard, so we can add a new contact. We can just see his public data first before we try to do anything. Um, we have two options here for making connection. The first one is the one I just described. Um, we have another way, which is like posting a message on the blockchain, um, which kind of solves the problem in a different way. But, um, you know, we're here to talk about Swarm, so uh, the Swarm way is the main way. Uh, so Bob is pending, so at this point Alice is like polling the predictable feed location for Bob. Um, so now on Bob's mainframe OS we're going to do the opposite, so we add Alice's feed. And we can see that it is Alice and um, try to make the connection. So now they're both fending, they're both just like pulling each other's feeds. And then eventually once they see that the other person has initiated first contact as well, they'll mark them as like connected. And yeah, you can see, so now they both, now that we have a bootstrap communication between these two users and we can do like other fun things. <coughs> Um, so one of those things we can do with the Ethereum address is um, just directly be able to like interact with that user through their Ethereum address with like Web3 stuff um, without having to like copy and paste Ethereum addresses. So users who are maybe intimidated by dealing with addresses don't need to deal with it. So this is just like a toy app for just sending crypto to other users. So you can initiate a transfer. Um, when the DAP tries to inter interact with contacts, it actually comes up in this, that pop-down box. And that is like a, that is a protected part of the UI that is only controlled by mainframe OS. So the, so the DAP has no access to the contact list. Uh, the DAP has to request access. And then when you select a contact, there's like an anonymized reference to that contact handed to the uh, DAP. And then, uh, as the user or as the DAP calls, calls SDK functions with that anonymized contact address, uh, they're performed with the real contact data. So it's just a way to kind of like try to protect your contact list from being like scraped by malicious DAPs. <coughs> um, so yeah, we're also going to look at about how you actually like create DAPs and how you deploy them and what functionality we have there. Um, so, uh, if you create it, uh, this is just like me creating a DAP here. So, we have this app development tool in Mainframe OS. So, we first create a developer identity, which is how you're going to reference yourself as a developer. Um, then you can add a new DAP and then fill out some information about like the, the version and the name of your DAP. Uh, this is a React uh, DAP I built. So. Uh, I'm selecting the build directory for where the static content is going to be spat out. Uh, my DAP is going to do commu communications with users, so I'm going to mark that as a required permission. Um, anything that's optional will like prompt the user if you try to do that thing. Um, but I'm explicitly saying, like, don't even bother downloading this DAP unless you want to do communications. Um, so now I can work on developing the DAP. So um, I open it up. Right now it's not built, so there's nothing in the build directory. But um, if I'm using the nice React tools to, to do this, I can um, start a local web server and just be testing it in that, and then still get access to all the like existing 
JavaScript development tools, like the, uh, uh, you saw the Chrome debug tools there. Uh, it's gonna ask me if I wanna access localhost because generally accessing the web is not allowed in mainframe apps. Um, <clears throat> and you can see here it's prompted me for another permission to access contacts because maybe I've forgotten that I also need contacts and I'm gonna wanna change that later. Um, so this is an example of some of the UI in my mood app and uh, I've decided that like I wanna change some of the styling. So you can see you, you've got all your like hot reloading and stuff you get from the React development tools so you can use your existing development to tools to do this. Um, yeah, I like the size of this better, so I'm gonna make it big. Okay, so that is how you, that's kind of the development flow for building uh, dApps on uh, mainframe OS. So then publishing, uh, so for publishing the, the apps, we're using um, the timelines that uh, Milos mentioned just before this. Uh, and this allows you to have like a history of, of app versions so that if you wanna like roll back or like see what versions are available and, and uh, all the changes, you can, you can have access to that. Um, this one. Okay, so I finished build it or finished with my real time debugging so I'm gonna build a production debug build or a production build of my DAP and then it'll it'll get dumped into the uh, the build directory which is just gonna be like my static content and my JavaScript files and then I can click publish in the app development tool. You have an, another opportunity to change your permissions and I decided I want that contact permission so I'm gonna make it required and then click publish. So what's happening here is, first of all, you're uploading all your app content to Swarm. Uh, then you're uploading a manifest, which is describing the permissions and like signing keys for the DAP to prevent like malicious updates and all this sort of stuff. And then we're publishing a timeline, which is pointing to that, which is gonna be able to track the history of the versions. And then at the end, we have like a reference here that we can use for sharing the app. And again, internally, it's just gonna be a, a swarm feed. Um, so then, once we have this feed hash, we can share it with other users. So I want to share my new app with Bob. So I can send him my app ID. Um, he can install an app, paste my app ID. Um, first of all, it'll download the manifest for the file to show like the name and what permissions it requires. Uh, Bob's cool with that, so he's gonna download the app. So it downloads a copy of the app, just like we saw earlier. And when it finishes, we can open it, and you know, it, it should look the same as the, uh, the app that we created earlier. So yeah, there it is. Okay, uh, we can also update apps. Um, this was my attempt at ma making impress work earlier, but it didn't, so that's why that's there. Um, app updating. So this is about like, you can publish updates to your app and then other users who are, or your existing users of your app will just detect these updates and be able to download new versions. So I'm gonna assume that I've changed the code and made some awesome improvements and I'm changing my version number to indicate that it's like a patch release. Um, I have the opportunity to like rename my app if I think it has like a better name. Um, and I can change the permissions in case I've added new functionality, but I haven't, so I'm gonna leave it. And then publish the update. Uh, so this is gonna do the same thing as we saw earlier with your first update. It's going to uh, publish the app data, then upload a new manifest, and then it's gonna publish a timeline update to that DAP. Uh, it took a while when I was demoing this earlier, so at some point later, uh, Bob will detect the update and he has the option to update from version 010 to 011 and he can download the app and um, start using the new functionality. Uh, so, uh, in this app we're using communications. Um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how the feeds are structured. Um, to, to enable like all, uh, the communication between users because again, like, like I said, we wanted to make it easier for developers to access these tools and to kind of do 
they just want to make users communicate. They don't necessarily want to learn all about Swarm and how feeds work and everything. So uh, the way we have it implemented is, uh, this is the contact feed, which is like the private feed that we saw created way back when we talked about first contact. Um, so some of the information in that is like private profile information. So you might have like additional information you want to re reveal about yourself to your contacts. Uh, that can go in there. Um, we also have information about apps that the, u that the user wants to interact with you uh, with. Um, so these app, app IDs, uh, it's a key value, key value list with just like an app ID pointing to another feed specifically for that app. Uh, so in the app feed, um, it's got more feeds. Uh, so within the app, you could have different types of communications that you want to do. So you might have like, oh, this thing's an image, and this thing's like a list of messages, and you want to keep track of all these things. So again, this is just like another key value store. So we've got just string keys, and then each one of those points to another feed. Uh, and then that feed is one that's actually used for the comms. So your, all your application layer data gets dumped into these feeds. Um, and I'll just show you what this code actually looks like. Um, so this is the, the code from, can everyone see that? Um, this is the code, code from my Moods app. Uh, so when I want to uh, select a contact that's going to be used to, that I want to interact with in my app, uh, I call uh, this function uh, contacts.selectContact. So that'll drop down the contact picker and once you select a contact, um, it'll get called back into this code. And I'm going to try to fetch that user's mood. Um, when I'm trying to fetch the user's mood, uh, the first thing I do is check what subscribable feeds that user has already created for me. And crucially, I'm looking for the one with the key mood. Uh, if it doesn't, doesn't exist, I'll wait and then see, or like check again in a few seconds, see if the user's created it. Um, but if they have created the mood feed, I'm going to subscribe to it. And what this does is it will, um, I mean, in the background, it's going to be polling the feed for changes. Um, but how it's going to work in the front end is you'll get, it'll return the current value uh, that's stored in the feed. And then only when the feed is updated, you'll get the callback again. So it's just kind of like handy, convenient stuff. So if the user changes their mood, I'm going to just set the variables and then update. Um, and then the other comms thing is about when I'm setting my mood. Uh, so if I choose my new mood, I iterate over my contacts because each, um, each communication is per contact. So I'm going to iterate over all the contacts that I've already shared with the DAP. I'm going to call comms publish uh, to the mood feed and then just dump in the mood and timestamp. So like, it's just like super easy JavaScript JSON style. Uh, updating here. Um, so now I'll show you what that looks like uh, in the actual DAP. Um, comes. get this to play. Okay. Uh, so this is Alice. Uh, she's opening the moods app and she's going to want, or like she's made friends with Bob now, so she's going to share her mood. So the first thing she's going to do is hit that drop down to access to the list of contacts and choose Bob. Checks Bob's feed. There's nothing there because Bob, Bob has never used the app yet, um, but she's going to send her mood anyway, and that's going to write to her contact feeds for Bob. Um, so yeah, and then this is Bob's instance of the Moods app. Uh, so Bob is going to do the same thing. He's going to want to know about Alice's mood, so he adds her. Um, initially, like waiting for updates to, for like the uh, there's like because of all the feeds that you have to run through, you kind of are like pulling them all on a timer. But he sets his mood, and now you can see uh, he's received Alice's mood from her uh, his pulling of her feed. So the subscription is fired. And then hopefully Alice will also get the update. Because, um, yeah, so again, this is what I was talking about with uh, PSS versus feeds. So right now, everything's kind of like asynchronous like this because we're just relying on feeds and like constantly checking to see if, well, on a, on a timer, checking to see if they update. 
and we've gotten Bob's update. But w once we have PSS layered on here too, the hope is that like this will all be like way more real time. Um, but yeah, like I said earlier, um, really light nodes is going to be the key to like having this real time snappiness. Um, and that's it. So I hope you enjoyed the demo, and thank you very much.